There's a popular social media influencer on the prowl by the name of Chris Kirkpatrick, who's been telling a lot of tall tales about Index Universal Life. In today's video, I'm gonna debunk those claims one by one. I was recently sent a YouTube video in which Chris Kirkpatrick shares his thoughts on Index Universal Life. I watched the entire 70 minute interview and believe me when I tell you I've never seen anything like it. Now, before we get into this interview, I'd like to lay a little foundation. There's a trend in the financial services industry that I find a bit unsettling. Advisors who advocate for permanent life insurance tend to balkanize around two basic products, whole life and index universal life. In fact, those two products account for the vast majority of permanent life insurance sales in the industry. And for many of these advisors, unfortunately, their primary sales approach consists in exalting their own preferred product by debasing the alternative product. So it's not a question of letting either whole life or IUL stand on their own merits. It becomes a war of words. Chris Kirkpatrick happens to be one of the loudest and most vociferous proponents of whole life insurance. And he tends to do it at the expense of index universal life. In this interview, he begins by discussing the alleged genesis of Index Universal Life Insurance. He explains how in the 80s and 90s that whole life insurance companies had high dividend rates due to sky high interest rates. However, something happened when those interest rates began to fall. Take a listen. But what happened was they started maturing in the early 2000s. Yeah. A lot of and so in, into a really low interest rate environment. And so these actuaries were looking at it and like looking at the political environment, looking at the economic environment and being like, we don't see it changing anytime soon. And with the guarantees of 4% that we have in these whole life policies, we're going to be potentially in trouble. So we need to do something, right? We need, we need to stop selling as many of these first and foremost. And it's funny, I could show you a graph. I don't have it on me. I wish I had thought we were going to go here, but like <laughs> you can see this graph of, of how whole life sales just dropped off a cliff in, yeah. in like the late nineties and index universal life started going like off the charts, like oh, from like 2004 to 2009. And then, yeah. and then from 2009 to 2015, it went even crazier. And so the reason is because this, the insurance companies wanted to scale down their sales of whole life, because when you buy a whole life policy, all the risk is on the insurance company, right? And because when you buy a guaranteed your dividend, because of the guarantee dividend. Yep. Okay, so according to Chris Kirkpatrick, insurance companies that were selling whole life could no longer afford the guarantee, so they needed a new profit center that could help them cover their costs. And that profit center appeared in 2003 in the form of Index Universal Life. So IUL was basically just a way for whole life insurance companies to pay for their promises they'd made in their whole life policies, but could no longer afford to keep. The clear insinuation here is that insurance companies' whole life policies were so undercapitalized that they needed a new product that was bursting with fees to help bail them out. Now, there's only one problem with this just so story. It isn't true. First of all, insurance companies that have historically offered IUL haven't offered whole life. And conversely, companies that historically have offered whole life have tended not to offer IUL. You can go down the list of the biggest whole life insurance companies in the nation. Northwestern Mutual, New York Life, Guardian, you name it. These companies didn't even offer IULs in 2003. In fact, most of them didn't offer them until recently. And to this day, Northwestern Mutual still doesn't offer indexed universal life. This, of course, begs the question, how could IULs have been a profit center for whole life companies back in 2003 if not a single one of them had them on offer? You want to know what really paved the way for Index Universal Life? It was the stock market crash of the early 2000s. Throughout the 90s, Variable Universal Life, or VUL, had been the fair-haired child of the insurance industry. You could pass your premiums through the insurance company and into mutual funds called sub-accounts where they could grow at in some cases, 30% per year. Well, everything was rosy right up until the stock market went down for three straight years starting in 2000. Many VULs that weren't structured properly crashed and ultimately lapsed. So this spooked a lot of policyholders and VUL sales tanked across the industry. In response to that, life insurance companies ever nimble created a product that would allow you to link the growth of your cash value to the upward movement of a stock market index, let's say the S&P 500. Whatever that index did, you got to keep 
up to a cap. And if that index ever went down in any given year, they would simply credit you a zero. A guaranteed floor was the perfect antidote to stock market link policies that no longer seemed safe. And why did IUL sales surge even more in 2009? Were life insurance companies once again trying to create profit centers for underperforming whole life policies? Come on, of course not. It was a response to the stock market collapse of 2008. You see, the growth of IUL sales had everything to do with creating a hybrid product that could still allow investors to capture some of the upside of the stock market, but safeguard against another crash. Okay, in the next excerpt, Chris Kirkpatrick attempts to make the case that IUL companies lure you in with artificially high cap rates, and once they've sucked you in, they drop those cap rates precipitously. Have a listen. The most I could have earned, earned right now is 6.5%. So why is that? Because they use a 12.5% to get you in, or whatever the high cap rate is to get you in, and then they yeah. reduce them as your contract matures. And legally, if you look at the contract, they have the ability to do so. They're right. allowed. And what, what is criminal to me is a life insurance company doesn't have to publicize what the current cap rates are of older generation products unless they're currently marketing and selling them. So what they do is they go, here's generation one index universal life, 12% yeah. cap rate. They sell it for three years. That runs its rate. That cap rate is high because that's a marketing expense, right? Yeah. Then they launch generation two. As soon as they launch generation two, cap rate is the same high and they add a couple extra features to make it look really attractive and say, hey, we just improved it, right? Yeah. And then while they do that, meanwhile, all the generation one cap rates start coming down. Okay, let me summarize the allegation here. IUL carriers lure you in with a high cap rate and once you're in the program, they systematically lower your cap rate so that they can keep all the profits for themselves. After all, they need all those profits to prop up their floundering whole life policies. Or so the story goes. What's worse, they feel like they can do this because they aren't required to publicly disclose their cap rates. And the unsuspecting consumer is all the worse for it. Well, this certainly casts IUL companies in a nefarious light, which is precisely what Kirkpatrick is going for. But is this the uniform practice of IUL companies across the board? Are they all out there preying upon unsuspecting Americans who are easily duped by high first year cap rates? Do they start you at 13% and quickly drop those cap rates down to 6% or lower over time? Fortunately, this wildly extravagant claim can be easily fact-checked. You see, most IUL companies, including the ones that I personally recommend to my clients, are happy to report the rates of return that every generation of policyholders has experienced since they began offering IULs. If what Kirkpatrick says is true, namely that they suck you in with promises of high caps and then drop those caps down to 6%, then you would expect average rates of return of 3 or 4% over time. But that's not at all what you find upon closer examination. In the following graphic, a well-known IUL company, I'll call them Company A, shows the growth of an IUL that was issued back in 2006. The dark green line shows what the illustrated or projected rate of return was from 2006 through 2021. Then the light green line shows precisely how the policy performed over that exact same time period, basically 8%. So quick question, if companies are accustomed to luring you in with high cap rates and then dropping them immediately thereafter, how did this IUL manage to get an 8% rate of return over a 15 year time frame. And the next graphic through a different IUL carrier, I'll call them company B, you'll see that a policy that was begun in 2006 has averaged just shy of 7% through December 31st, 2021. That's a 15 year track record of 7%. Moving forward in time, we see that a policy that was begun in 2009 has experienced average annual growth of over 8%. A policy that was begun in 2019 has averaged nearly 9% annual growth. In fact, if you take all of the average rates of return of all 15 generations of policies since 2006 with this particular company, you'll find that they average 7.09%. In other words, through all the ups and downs in the stock market and even through low interest rate environments, these policies have still averaged over 7%. How could these two different companies show sustained returns of 7 and 8% if they lure you in with unrealistically high cap rates and then drop them sharply in year two? Something about Kirkpatrick's claim here just isn't adding up. In the next clip, Kirkpatrick makes an even bolder claim. And the only thing guaranteed when you look at an illustration in a, in an, inside of an IUL is that it's not going to perform like it shows. It's going to be worse.
That's like guaranteed, 100% of the time. Okay, so what is he saying here? He's claiming that your IUL is 100% guaranteed to perform worse than its illustrated rate at policy inception. Well, if companies did have the custom of dropping cap rates in year two and beyond, then we would expect to see this reflected in their rates of return. Once again, let's go back to company A. They projected an 8% rate of return way back in 2006. And how is that IUL actually performed? Right around 8%. Now, Let's take a look at the maximum illustrated rate of return for company B. The highest rate that can currently be illustrated is 7.04%. And when you look at the average rates of return of every generation of IUL policies since 2006, what do you see? You see an average of 7.09%. The average historical rate of return on every generation of policy since 2006 is actually higher than the maximum illustrated rate of 7.04%. In fact, in nearly every generation of IUL since 2006, you'll find that the average rate of return was at or above that 7% range. This would tend to support the idea that at least in the case of company B, they have a tendency to underpromise and over deliver. Now, this isn't to say that IUL companies don't lower their cap rates because they do, but this is more a function of them being constrained by a falling interest rate environment than their desire to lure you in with a tantalizingly high cap rate and then dropping it down once they have you in their clutches. In fact, in a recent conversation I had with an actuary from company A, they acknowledged that they did drop cap rates in early 2022, only to raise them again later in 2022 when interest rates began to rise. The same company also raised caps on their enforced block of IULs in 2009, 2010, and 2011. In other words, they weren't required to raise caps on their enforced business, but they did so because it was the right thing to do. This reality is sharply at odds with Kirkpatrick's narrative. In the next clip, you'll learn that IUL companies are far more scheming and nefarious than you ever thought possible. It's worse than that. They give you high cap rates early in the policy when the surrender charges are large, so you can't actually liquidate while you're doing right. well. Or be too and then to as, do it. Yeah. as the surrender charges you know, go away, the cap rates come down. Right. In summary, not only do insurance companies dramatically drop cap rates as a matter of policy, but they do so early in your surrender charge period when the sting of cashing out your policy is the greatest. Well, I hate to beat a dead horse here, but let's go back to our chart from company B. We know that surrender charges are the most severe in the first five years or so of an IUL policy. So if Kirkpatrick's thesis were true, then we'd expect to see policies in their first five years that had much lower average rates of return. But that's not at all what we see. When we look at the generation of policies that began in 2016, we see that they averaged over 7.5%. This is surprising given Kirkpatrick's claim that IUL companies are most likely to drop your cap when your surrender charges are the greatest. Now, Chris Kirkpatrick seems like a nice guy. I have no qualms with him personally, but in this interview and elsewhere on social media, he repeatedly overstates or misrepresents his case against IUL. I've been researching IUL for the last 15 years of my life, and I've never not once heard any of the criticisms that I heard in this video. And I've gone the rounds with plenty of life insurance actuaries, as well as anti-IUL gurus, such as Clark Howard, the White Coat Investor, and others. None of his claims in this interview stand up to any measure of scrutiny at all. They simply don't check out. He very clearly has an agenda of selling whole life insurance, and he wants to do so at the expense of indexed universal life. Now, don't get me wrong, indexed universal life isn't a perfect product, but neither is whole life. When you choose indexed universal life, you sacrifice guarantees for higher rates of return. When you choose whole life, you sacrifice higher rates of return for guarantees. These two products just happen to sit at different spots on the risk continuum. So the next time you see a social media influencer slash whole life salesman make negative claims about IUL, be sure to put those claims under the microscope. And remember, there's no perfect product, only the best product for your particular situation. If you wanna learn how permanent life insurance fits into a comprehensive balanced approach, 
to tax for retirement, head on over to DaveMcKnight.com and click on the Work with David button. I'm happy to lend a hand. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to drop them into the comment section below. I will respond to every single one of those comments or questions personally. And don't forget to click like, subscribe, and the bell so you never miss a video. This is David McKnight. I look forward to seeing you on the next video.